So my name's Ben Bulchanda and um, I've been a Buddhist nun for about 12 years now. Um, I came in contact with Ajahn Brahm's teachings while I was still uh, practicing in Burma and I wasn't really listening to many Western monks' teachings at that time but when I heard these teachings it felt very profound and very relevant to where I was at in my practice at that time. Um, and I had a very strong feeling to leave Burma and, and find Ajahn Brahm to take personal guidance from him. And at that time I didn't know that he was supporting bhikkhunis. Um, I wasn't fully ordained at that point, but uh, when I heard that he, he was supporting the full ordination of women in the Theravada tradition, I got very inspired. Because I think when, when you ordain as a, as a non, mm. it's a full ordination from the heart, but mm. often the opportunity to actually take the, the ordination officially is not there. So when I realised that was available, I was really excited and uh, went to Perth and stayed in Perth for about four or five years. Mm. Um, and then in 2015, Ajahn Brahm and I discussed the possibility of starting a place in England for fully ordained women, so to give them the opportunity here to practice the way the Buddha intended. So. How, how, how would you remain optimistic and, and, and faithful in, in, in such a chaotic world? The world has always been chaotic, so you do have a choice. If you look at the future, which is where our fear or positivity live, is you have the choice. Uh, either you can look in the future with a positive mind, and that's called hope, or you can look in the future with a negative mind, which is called worry. And so you have a choice there, and you'll notice that if you regard the future with the possibilities of hope, then you encourage a positive outcome. If you look at the future with a negative mind, you are actually making more negativity in the future. It's one of the ancient laws which transcends all religions, called Murphy's Law. <laughs> if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. But it doesn't really go wrong. It just gives you a different challenge in life. Mm. So the outside world, whatever happens, death, sickness, Brexit, Trump, or whatever happens in life, it's just how you make use of it. How you you take those opportunities which change gives you, rather than be afraid of change. And would it be any different from the female perspective? The same question. It's an really interesting question. I actually agree with Ajahn Brahm, and I remember I think last year we did a talk in uh, one of the venues in London, same place we were last night in the uh, Kagyu Samyazon, and it was called um, something like Making Peace with an Uncertainty. And it kind of turned into more than just making peace, but actually embracing uncertainty. And I think it's when we kind of move into areas that are unknown or are a little bit scary that we have to kind of find our resources within ourselves. So with my project, for example, I would have never decided to do this of my own accord, but because there's an opportunity, I'm sort of stepping into the unknown every day and it brings out a certain amount of curiosity, um, having to find inspiration, um, so it, it's it's very uh, helpful, I think, to to actually embrace that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. What would you say to people like this that, that use religious beliefs um, um, to to as a pretext to violence? What would you say to them? Is that um, you don't mm -hmm. uh, change the world for the better through violence; just make it worse. Because when you use violence against one person. It hurts so many, 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 many people. It's not just the person you kill. It's all their relations, all their friends, all the people who care for them. It also hurts you. And it you know, shames your family and friends. Violence is never a solution. And that's something we should learn. We learn from, from our history. That violence only causes more people to seek revenge. Anything you would like to add? I guess for me the core of religion is the ethics. So beliefs are not really very useful if they don't translate into a way we actually live. And I think the root of all religion is harmlessness. Mm. So, you know, to call somebody an Islamic extremist or a you know, Christian extremist or maybe mm. a Buddhist fundamentalist is completely wrong. I mean, it's got nothing to do with the religion. It's just mm. a, an attitude of mind which is very hardened and very hostile. 
that comes from a person suffering actually. Mm. Um, so I think it's important to separate extremist acts from religion. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. the essence of all religion is to live a life of compassion and non-harm. Mm. What would you say to uh, the, the, the new generations, the millennials and the children, uh, um, um, <coughs> in terms of um, how to control their anger, how to control their desires to want more and more? <laughs> it's actually understanding what you really want. It's sometimes we just follow other people and think, well, once we get rich, once we become successful, once we become a celebrity, then we'll be happy. And now, here's a bit of your wisdom. Is that what happiness really is? So you ask people just your happiest moments in your life so far, what were they? And were they dependent upon getting what you want? Or were they dependent upon appreciating what you already have? As an old saying goes, when you want something more, you cannot enjoy what you already have. Thank you. And, and what do we want in life? Do you know, following his, yeah. his wisdom, what do we want? I think um, a lot of the time we're looking for happiness, but we don't really know how to define it properly. Mm. So we think of happiness as a pleasant feeling or a pleasant experience, you know, related to the sense world, whether it's a pleasant sight or something stimulating normally. Mm. But I think real happiness is a sense of contentment. It's a much deeper kind of uh, happiness, which doesn't depend on things going just to plan. And it can embrace even times when things, you know, are suffering or you know, difficult situations in life or difficult feelings in the body. You know, if we can just remain content, mm -hmm. it's a different kind of happiness. Yeah. We're more economist to all the ups and downs. So. Yeah. What would it be your hope for? the world we're living nowadays, <laughs> or your hopes if there are several. Yes. Well, this is it's incredible, amazing, it's wonderful. Just know uh, how uh, most people are very, very safe. And sometimes that when we emphasize the times when things go wrong. As you know, I'm from Australia, so I spent most of my time. And recently there was much concern, not about terrorist uh, Islamic extremists, but shark extremists who go eating young men and young women in the surf. Mm. And sometimes people got so upset about shark attacks until somebody pointed out that more people die falling out of bed in the morning <laughs> than getting eaten by sharks. Very true. So we should stop people sleeping at night time by the same, the same ideas. Yes, no, there are some accidents which happen in life, unfortunate occurrences, shark attacks, terrorist attacks, uh, plane crashes. This is part of our life. Mm. So we say we embrace it. We don't over exaggerate. Mm. And sometimes hope is moving our world's negativity closer to reality. Mm. We're so negative, far too negative. Mm. So hope is just pushing it a little bit further with a positive attitude towards the future. And that encourages people to keep working their butts off mm -hmm. to make a good world instead of feeling, oh, this is terrible, this is hopeless, it will never work. Mm. Just when I crossed the Thames the other day on the train, I remember as a kid, there was big signs along the Thames River saying if anyone falls in, please call the ambulance straight away because the Thames was heavily polluted. And people thought there's no way of solving that, but the, the government did. Mm. And they now it's a very clean river. Well, those fish have come back into the river. So, there's always hope. If one gives up, then it's only disaster. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, do we do we need to shield our worry and our feel and our, our um, fear? Is is that necessary? What, what do we have to do it. to shield it? I think sometimes these kind of emotions um, lead to an automatic response to want to close up. Because the very nature of fear is a kind of contracted sense mm. of tension, you know, that causes us to go inside ourselves. And in a way, it's the precise opposite movement that's needed. I think we need to open up and perhaps share some of those fears with others. Mm. I think you can gain great strength through vulnerability. People often think vulnerability is a kind of weak state, but I think it's really powerful. Yeah. And um, I know for myself, you know, there's been times in my life when I felt very um, ill at ease or not really welcome in a place and I felt very vulnerable 
and eventually I just decided to be really honest about that and turn up in the morning, you know, if sometimes I was trembling or sometimes I felt kind of afraid of meeting people, I'd just say, yeah, I'm feeling a bit vulnerable today. And it was amazing. It gave other people permission to feel their own vulnerability too. Mm -hmm. um, so I think actually, yeah, obviously you need to function in life, but uh, I think we can be a little bit more honest and learn to soften around those emotions. It actually gives others the gift as well, to feel mm. their own feelings. Is there, are there any um, final words or any message that you would like to, to uh, share with us and, and to the people that is going to be watching this interview that comes from um, your experience as a Buddhist and your experience in life and how to combine the two of them? It's it's a very challenging message. A lot of people disagree with me. But please don't try to change. Don't embrace you know, your craziness, your uh, stupidity. Uh, laugh more and realize, as I mentioned in an earlier talk, that you're just a tree in a forest. And it's wonderful to be crooked, bent and twisted. Otherwise, if all the trees in the forest were straight, it would be the most boring, unnatural, plastic forest in the whole world. So, just uh, stop trying to improve. Great, thank you so much. What would you be in your final thoughts? <laughs> um, just on the subject of hope again, I was thinking that, um, you know, if we look at the immediate environment around us, there's so much good that you can find there. I mean, just the other day on the train, um, I was trying to get into the train and there was a lady with a, a pram. So I helped open the doors so she could get in because she almost got trapped in these doors. And, I, and then I stepped back and, and stood on this woman's foot and we were both like apologising and we held hands and we had the most loving, tender kind of exchange. Then we were on the train again and she was like, you sit down. And I was like, no, you sit down. Mm -hmm. And another guy said, no, you have the seat. And I think these kind of incidences are all around us, you know, and we can create them as well. So hope is also about what we put in, you know, it's not only what's happening outside, but we can be a part in that, mm. we can be a part in creating the kind of place we want to live in. So I think don't underestimate small acts of kindness. Yeah, so I mentioned in the beginning that um, I took the full ordination in Perth to practice as a bhikkhuni. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the system of training laid out by the Buddha sort of 2,600 years ago. And uh, until now that's not really been available to women in this tradition, although it's been preserved in the Mahayana tradition. So in a way we're all one because the Vinaya is the same. Um, and just recently we've been working with this for about three years to start a small place in England for women to come and stay and to train if they want to of this lifestyle because it's a lifestyle of simplicity and a lifestyle where you're in a community which consciously tries to live kindly and tries to you know take care of oneself and, and others around us and so just recently we actually signed a lease for a five uh, sorry a three bedroom property um, in Oxford mm. and eventually it's going to be a bigger property mm. but this is the first quite pivotal step so okay. we're very excited about that and uh, and we hope that you know this is going to bring people together to practice and to, to support each other in their practice. So that's the main purpose of it, because we think we need more places which are safe mm. and where we can really you know, learn about our mind and how to work with our mind and, and develop a kind of happiness that's not dependent on the external mm. situation. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Very good.